Okay, good morning everyone. I uh, hope you're all uh, happy and well. Uh, back to human-computer interaction. Um, hopefully most of you managed to submit uh, Deliverable 7 uh, by the deadline last night. Hands up how many people have a KNN predicting more than 50% of the time on two digits or more? Three digits or more? Five digits or more? Six digits or more? Seven digits or more? Eight digits or more? Nine digits or more? Ten digits? Okay, some but not everyone. If you're still struggling, um, uh, do come and see uh, Amanda or I during our office hours uh, on Thursday and we'll, uh, we'll try and help you out. Regardless, uh, I would encourage you to move on to uh, Deliverable 8, which is now uh, posted, and Deliverable 8 will be due, uh, as usual, next Monday uh, at midnight. So just a couple words about uh, Deliverable 8. Um, we're gonna switch. Uh, we're gonna switch now back away from KNN to the user interface, and in this deliverable, you're going to be storing data generated by a user's interaction uh, with your system. You are not going to be setting up a database uh, in this during this week. Um, creating web-based databases is a little bit beyond the scope uh, of this course. So we're going to do things in a little bit of a hacky uh, manner. We're going to be storing all data generated by your user uh, as they interact with your system in an HTML unordered list. So you're going to be working with a mixture of, uh, of HTML and JavaScript uh, this week. That being said, I hope most, uh, most of the material here in Deliverable 8 is, uh, is pretty straightforward. Any quick questions about Deliverable 7, Deliverable 8? The deliverables in general. Anything else? Oh, uh, as some of you noticed, uh, of course, right before the deadline, uh, the imager uh, image web uh, image hosting site uh, was down or unavailable yesterday. Thanks to Alex and some of the others for posting uh, alternatives. Doesn't matter where you store your images on the web, as long as your JavaScript can can access it, it's fine with us. Okay, uh, one other note uh, about Deliverable 7. As most of you noticed, your KNN is not perfect, and, and it's very unlikely that you're ever going to get your KNN to be perfect. We're looking for better than 50%. That might mean that your KNN only recognizes zero when your hand is here, but not here, doesn't recognize it here, 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 and so on. It's okay for the moment if you can relatively easily, because you know your system, know where and how you need to hold your hand to demonstrate uh, a given uh, digit. Obviously your users, when we're gonna get to user testing in a couple of weeks, they are not gonna know where they need to hold their hand and at what orientation. So you can provide some visualizations about helping them to orient their, their hand and position their hand appropriately. So you can provide some scaffolding or some support to help them, uh, to, to help them figure out where and how they need to make the gesture for your KNN to recognize it. Okay. All good? Okay, then uh, back to lecture. Uh, we started in uh, last week on uh, the second last theme of the course, this idea of looking uh, outward. Um, we're in a very exciting era uh, from an HCI perspective where we're creating combinations of hardware and software that we are deploying out into the world and that out, uh, we can interpret that outward movement in lots uh, of different ways. One of the most important things is that our constellation of technologies that are out there, our interactive technologies, are more directly sensing the world and more directly acting on the world than a passive laptop or desktop which sits at home and waits for you to type some input uh, into it. That, that's sort of the most important transition we're going to see as we move through a bunch of different technologies, interactive technologies, that we're deploying out there into the world. We uh, started last time talking about one particular vector of outward growth, which is crowdsourcing. So instead of having a desktop that interacts with one person and indirectly interacts with lots of other people over the web, 
in crowdsourcing, we are developing software that is that is intentionally trying to draw information together from a very large number of users to enable that group of users to do something that would be difficult or impossible uh, for any one member of the crowd to do uh, on their own. We will finish that lecture today. We'll move on to, uh, again, this issue about creating interactive technologies that directly sense and interact with us. And in, 50, in lecture 15, we're going to look at uh, tactile in information or a tactile interaction, tangible interaction through touch. Okay. So back to uh, crowdsourcing, we finished uh, the lecture last time by posing a challenge, a challenge that was solved by a team at MIT in nine hours. This is the DARPA's Red Balloon Challenge. Just as a reminder, uh, DARPA is the research wing of the Department of Defense. They're interested in technologies that would allow uh, large groups of people to organize them and quickly find something that would be difficult to, for any one person to find or unlikely for any one person to find. So a needle in the haystack type problem. They placed these 10 red balloons at these various locations throughout the continental United States. The MIT team was able to solve this in nine hours. How do you think they did it? We were brainstorming a little bit about different ways to solve the red balloon challenge last time. We finished by talking about incentivization strategies. How would you go about incentivizing a group of people to find these balloons? In addition to the question of how to incentivize them, what are you incentivizing them to do? If we are going to try and incentivize people, perhaps with cash, remember the, uh, the team that finished this competition first, got a cash prize of $40,000 uh, from DARPA. It's unlikely that you'll be able to financially incentivize somebody to find a balloon because the chance of any one person finding the balloon is unlikely. So they're unlikely to take you up on getting one-tenth of the winnings if they find one of the balloons here, which would be $4,000. What would be a better thing to incentivize our potential participants to do? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. If it's hard to incentivize a group of your friends, for example, if you were trying to solve this problem, incentivize them to find a balloon, what might you ask them to do? or pay them to do so, assuming you win. So one of the things you might want to do is obviously if you were in, in to invite all of your friends to participate with you and try and win this challenge, your group of friends is probably too small to collectively find all the balloons but all of the friends of your friends plus your friends, you may have a higher chance of finding one or maybe two balloons. All of the friends of all of your friends of all of your friends, that's a much, much larger group of people. They might, and if we keep working outward, you could imagine if we can incentivize our friends to invite their friends to find the balloon. Great, okay. But that's a large number of people, and we can't give a cash prize to everyone. So what the M MIT team did was to recursively incentivize those to invite their friends with the promise that if I invite my friends and one of my friends finds the balloon, that friend will get part of the $40,000, and I will also get a cash reward for inviting my friends. Okay. So how does this work? So the MIT, the MIT team took their $40,000, they cut it into 10 equal parts of $4,000 uh, each, and they did offer a cash prize for anyone that found a balloon, which is 2,000 of that 4,000 total assigned to one balloon. That leaves 2,000 left over. So in this example here, um, if Alice is a member of the MIT team um, and she invited her friend Bob and Bob in turn invited uh, a bunch of his friends including Carol and Carol invited one of her friends Dave and Dave was the one that found the balloon, Carol 
it, because she invited someone who found the balloon, she gets half of what someone who finds a balloon gets, which is a thousand. Bob here uh, invited someone who invited someone that found the balloon, so he gets half. And Alice, who originally invited Bob, gets half as well. So as we move from the, uh, if we, we move from the edge of this tree, where this tree represents friends who invite their friends, who invite their friends, and who invite their friends, so not a social network, but a social tree, we are uh, incentivizing anyone, we're in incentivizing everyone to invite as many of their friends as possible under the assumption that one of their friends may invite a friend who may invite, invite a friend who finds a balloon. Okay, so if you look along this branch of the tree, we have 2,000 plus 1,000 is 3,000, plus 500 is 3,500, plus 250 to Alice is 3,750, just shy of the total 4,000 that was allocate, is allocated for each balloon. So by having the financial reward as we move back up the tree, uh, we ensure that we're never going to break the bank and spend more than $4,000 on this set of friends that eventually led to the finding of one of the balloons. Um, whatever remained uh, from this branch, uh, the MIT team donated to, to charity. Okay, you can see in this branch uh, over here, uh, this group of friends was a little bit luckier. Uh, Alice's third friend here invited somebody that found the balloon uh, and so on. Make sense? So you can see, so the MIT team named this algorithm the recursive incentivization, crowdsourcing algorithm. They're incentivizing, and why is it recursive? Because they are not, incent the MIT team is not incentivizing people to find the balloon. They're incentivizing people to incentivize people to incentivize people and so on. So Bob was free to explain to his friends what this competition was, why his friends should participate, and so on. Bob is motivated to get as many of his friends to carry on this incentivization strategy uh, as possible. Um, of course, this is called a recursive incentivization uh, strategy, but we could, of course, also have called this a modern version of the pyramid scheme. Kind of an old idea uh, repackaged in a new form. Any questions about the Red Balloon Challenge before we move on? Actually, one of the interesting things, if you think about it, about the Red Balloon Challenge, DARPA incentivized research groups throughout the United States to solve this problem. So DARPA ended up incentivizing MIT to incent to eventually formulate this recursive incentivization strategy. So what the Red Balloon Challenge really was, was a crowd an eff crowdsourcing effort to crowdsource crowdsourcing algorithms. So lots of metas when it comes to, to crowdsourcing. Okay, here's an interesting plot. Uh, the MIT team uh, went ahead and wrote a research article about about their algorithm and they show, they're showing um, they're showing three different plots here, three different trees that correspond to uh, uh, one tree in which a group of friends, so starting at the, uh, uh, the green node here, this represented uh, one member of the MIT team. This MIT, this person invited a large number of their friends, as you can see here, who participated. And one of their friends had a friend who found the balloon. Here are two other attempts to do so that did not lead to a successful finding of a balloon. Okay, so what else is crowdsourcing good for? We're now gonna switch gears and I'm gonna show you a crowdsourcing project from my own research lab. Um, this is work that we started back in 2016. This is still uh, ongoing work. It has nothing to do with finding red balloons or tagging images. This is a completely different problem, but again, we're going to try and uh, use a crowdsourcing solution to this. So let me describe the problem first, and then I'll talk about how we tackled this with crowdsourcing. Um, as most of you probably know, one of the big outstanding uh, unsolved problems in AI and robotics is getting AI and robots to understand natural language. So a part, uh, English, French, uh, Japanese, and so on, as opposed to programming languages. 
How do we teach? Uh, how do we teach in our case robots to understand language and possibly use language uh, in future? Most attempts to try and teach machine language is to give them large sets of text from the internet with uh, hyperlinks between them or online dictionaries and hope that machines can, can learn language directly from English uh, or natural language text corpora groups, uh, large numbers of text documents. But if you think about it, this is a very difficult way to learn language, and this is definitely not the way that we learned language when we were young, when we learned our mother tongue. Here's why. Imagine uh, that you wanted to learn uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and I tried to teach you hieroglyphics by giving you a dictionary, which is hieroglyphics to hieroglyphics dictionary. So what do I mean by that? I mean every entry in the dictionary is a hieroglyphic, and the description of what that hieroglyphic is is written in a sequence of other hieroglyphs. So if you look up any, if you take any random hieroglyph in the dictionary, you'll see a whole bunch of other hieroglyphs, which by definition you don't know. So you have to pick another one of those hieroglyphs, go looking uh, for its entry in the dictionary, which is described by another set of hieroglyphs, and around and around you go. And there are problems with, with circularity in learning a language in that way. You may learn relationships, like this particular hieroglyph tends to be co-located very often with this other hieroglyph hieroglyph. But it seems unsatisfying somehow. You keep seeming to go around in circles. So there is an idea from uh, psychology known as symbol grounding. Symbol simply meaning the parts that make up a language. And the idea behind symbol grounding is that the way that humans learn language when we're young is that we see or hear symbols. We hear our mother or father uh, mention certain words. We hear these, these sounds out in the world. But those sounds are co-located in time with things that are happening to our own body and we learn to associate what we hear with physical sensation, things that are happening to us at that point uh, in time. And we'll see some examples of that in a couple, uh, couple lectures uh, as it relates to humans. In the case of robots, how might this work? Imagine we want to teach robots language not by giving them a whole bunch of text online, but instead we're going to let the robot move around and as it moves around, from time to time, we, as the teacher, are going to emit certain symbols or certain elements of language. And we're going to hope that the AI that's running on board the robot is able to detect that that word is associated with this physical experience. Let's imagine we have a very simple robot. This robot uh, moves around in its environment and it has some pressure sensors on its feet. It can feel when its feet are on the ground or off the ground. Uh, we have time on the horizontal axis here as the robot is moving around. The robot feels pressure on the soles of its feet and then just by random chance as it's moving all four feet, assuming it's a quadruped, a four-legged robot, all four feet come off the ground it feels that uh, all the pressure sensors in its feet drop to zero, and at that moment, the robot hears externally J-U-M-P. And I'm gonna spell out jump, because remember that the robot has no idea what jump means. It simply hears these characters. If the robot keeps moving and continues on with its, with its life, and every, every time that its feet happen to leave, all four of its feet leave, tend to leave the ground, it always hears J-U-M-P then this robot has the opportunity to ground this symbol in the soil of sensor motor experience. It's to ground this idea in the soil of its own felt experiences. If you ask the robot what JUMP will mean, if it may not tell you, but it will uh, lift itself off the ground, uh, heave, heave all of its weight off the ground so that all four of its feet are off the ground. The robot is showing you that it knows what jump means. So meaning is yet another uh, tricky subjective word. <laughs> the word meaning means different things to different uh, people. Thinking about thinking is misleading. We could argue about whether the robot actually understands the meaning of jump. But I would argue that if it's able to show you what jump means in its own experience, that's, that's a pretty good definition of meaning.
Okay. So if the robot can ground this word, J-U-M-P, in its own experience, what about slightly more abstract words? Jump is uh, what's known as a motoric word. It is something that's very close to the motors or muscles. It's, a, it's an action verb, something that we can take literally. You can yourself jump. You can close your eyes and imagine yourself jumping. It's a motoric word. What about a slightly less motoric, slightly more abstract word like the word movement? Perhaps the robot has an accelerometer on board, and an accelerometer, as the name implies, records acceleration. So the robot can feel when it's moving, and it can, <coughs> it can feel when the accelerometer is reporting non-zero values, <coughs> when the robot is stationary, and the accelerometer is reporting all zero values. Perhaps the robot notices that the teacher tends to emit the word M-O-V-E-M-E-N-T most of the time when the accelerometer reports non-zero values, but the teacher does not emit the symbol M-O-V-E-M-E-N-T when the accelerometer is zero. So the robot might learn that this symbol covers a wide range of experiences and this symbol, J-U-M-P, covers a subset of those experiences, a particular type of M-O-V-E-M-E-N-T. So maybe the robot can ground jump directly in sensor experience. Movement also in sensory experience, but a little bit uh, more uh, general. What about political movement? That's an even more abstract term, and socialism, and so on. So. This is still a theory, it's still not known, but maybe the way that we ground, the words that we learn uh, early on, like stop, don't, jump, go, stop, water, uh, cup, and so on, these are things that are very tightly connected with our muscle groups in our body. We bind them by looking for relationships between when that word is said and what we feel. And maybe we then recursively do the same thing with increasingly abstract words still a theory. You might, it might seem that a word like socialism seems almost impossible to ground in a ladder of terms where the bottom most rungs in the ladder are grounded directly in sensory experience. But if you take uh, democracy, on the other hand, if you think about it, there, are, there is actually a sensory metaphor that goes along with democracy. What is it? Democracy is clearly a very abstract word, like socialism. But are, is there sort of some actions out there in the world that have to do with actual movement or muscle groups that, te that are sort of a metaphor for democracy? Have you ever played tug of war? You have one long rope, you have two teams, both teams are pulling on the rope, sometimes one team is ahead of the other. If you've ever played that game, you can feel in your arms what it feels like to pull along with your fellow voters and make progress on your side. Or on the other hand, if the other team is stronger, you can feel despite the fact that you are pulling towards your side, you are being pulled against your will towards the other side. So even seemingly abstract words may in fact be grounded, our understanding of those abstract words may be grounded in our physical experiences. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay, as I mentioned, this is still just a theory. It's not really known how children uh, acquire language. So in this research project I'm going to show you now, uh, we used crowdsourcing to collect large numbers of human teachers to help robots ground uh, natural language in the robot's physical experience. So far so good, before I switch over and start talking about that project, uh, that potential solution to this problem, any questions about the problem, the symbol grounding problem? So far so good? Okay. 
Okay, so let's have a look at how this works. Um, first of all, we built a website called Twitch Plays uh, Robotics. I imagine most of you are familiar with Twitch TV, one of the biggest websites on the planet, where every day millions of people go and watch live streams of other people playing video games or cooking dinner. And uh, in live chat, they're able to comment um, with the streamer and also with, with each other. Um, within the Twitch universe, there are a set of channels called Twitch Plays channels, where the chat that you're able to type in uh, during the stream is not passive chat, but you can actually type in commands that influence the action uh, in the stream. Uh, the most famous example of this is Twitch Plays Pokemon. Somebody streamed uh, the original Pokemon video, video game, and people could type into chat up, down, left, right, and the majority votes were collected and sent to the game character in uh, in the game. So we built on that by uh, we built on that idea by building Twitch Plays Robotics, where what users type into chat influences the ability of the robots to ground natural language. So I'll show you how this works. I'll watch this for a while. Obviously, you can see uh, on the left that we have a virtual robot that is acting in a virtual uh, environment. This virtual world has some physics like gravity and friction and inertia. Remember that this robot, these robots are going to have to try and ground their, uh, they're going to have to try and ground language in their own experiences. Um, the two middle panels here correspond to in, in, uh, information about what the human teachers over here can do. The first thing that uh, the users can do is to watch the robot and decide what they would like to try and teach the robots. Which symbols does the crowd think that this robot may be cap capable of grounding in its own experience? You'll notice that in this point in the experience, um, the crowd is tending to uh, type in crawl forward. So the crowd has decided that at least this purple robot here uh, may be capable of learning uh, crawl forward. You can also see some people are getting tired of this robot and want to see something else. At this particular point, 10 people have voted to try and teach the robot crawl forward. Seven people have tried to teach the robot new robot or riot. Somebody else isn't sure what exactly is going on. So when this timer here counts down to zero, the, mo the most popular command is going to be issued to the robot. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, let's skip ahead to that point. Okay, so in three seconds here, the robot is going to switch over. And now crawl forward. <coughs> crawl forward is going to be issued to the robot. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a... I, I cut together... Uh, I cut together a bunch of different videos, so sorry, they don't quite line up. A anyways, that, that's fine. So at this point here, there's a different robot and the crowd is voting for walk forward. You'll notice that at this point, we have issued the command walk forward to the robot. And the crowd can now perform uh, a second task, which is to vote on whether the violet robot is walking forward, in which, type, in which case they type in VY for violet yes or they type in VN for Violet No. This robot is not obeying the command walk forward. So let's play Twitch Plays Robotics for a moment. You're going to see the blue, blue robot pop up in a moment. I want you to type BY if you think this robot is walking forward and BN if you don't think it's walking forward into the Teams chat. You can type it in at any, any point. Okay, so this particular robot, it's clear that uh, it's more or less unanimous, not quite unanimous, but, but almost, right? So there actually, uh, I mentioned before, there are two elements at play here. There is the language itself, W-A-L-K space F-O-R-W-A-R-D, the symbols. 
There is the robot's experience, which I haven't talked about yet. We don't know what sensors are on board this robot, but we're hoping whatever sensors it has, it can correlate those with the symbols. There's a third element that we've brought in now, which is social reinforcement. So reinforcement is again another concept from uh, psychology. Positive reinforcement is basically a reward and negative reinforcement is a punishment. So the eight or nine of you that just voted generally gave positive reinforcement for this robot. So whatever the physical experience that the blue robot just had as it was moving, it knows, at least according to the crowd, that that corresponds. That's what W-A-L-K space F-O-R W-A-R-D means. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. Um, at this point in time, you can see there are about 29 people playing. Some people were typing and voting um, or reinforcing the robots. You see orange, no, orange, yes. Most people are typing in uh, walk forward. Okay. Um, we started this back in 2016. Uh, Twitch Plays Robotics is still running to this day. Uh, I have the server here at home uh, because of the pandemic. So uh, I have to turn off the stream when I'm teaching. But if you want to try Twitch Plays Robotics yourself, I'll turn it back on after class. If you just Google Twitch Plays Robotics, you should be able to, to find it. Uh, a number of, of students uh, who have taken this class have worked on Twitch Plays Robotics over the last four years. Uh, David Matthews, who's here this morning, is, uh, has made some important improvements to Twitch Plays Robotics. In particular, uh, the word embeddings that are used for allowing the robot to quote unquote hear uh, here are these words. So if you're interested in this project, let me know. I'm always looking for, for eager undergrads who want to help uh, improve Twitch Plays Robotics. Okay, so uh, I've shown you the interface and let's now see how this interface was designed to help, uh, to help these robots ground language. As I just showed you, we have a master program, which is simulating virtual robots in a physics engine and then sending the resulting stream live to Twitch. We capture the chat that's typed in by Twitch users during the stream back into the master program and stored into a database. So we're capturing, uh, we've got a whole bunch of robots, we've got a whole bunch uh, of chat. Inside this database, uh, as, the Twitch, as the Twitch channel has been running uh, for the last four years, it's continuously generating more and more data. So here's a visualization of what this data looked like in 2016. We've gone through lots of different versions of Twitch Plays Robotics. We're just going to focus on uh, Twitch 1.0 today. In Twitch 1.0, there are two different robots, uppercase R is for robot, R0 and R1. Uh, R0, R0 was the simpler worm robot, and R1 is the more complex uh, quadruped. So we have R0, R0 is a worm, R1 is a quadruped. While these robots are running, as you saw, the crowd will periodically vote for uh, various commands, and then those commands are sent to the robot. So each robot collects a number of commands represented by uppercase C here, and we're going to represent them with two subscripts, I, J. So su C sub I, J corresponds to the Jth command issued to robot I. So C sub zero four represents the fifth command that was sent to the zeroth robot. Okay, for each one of these controllers, we played the, the worm or the quadruped many, many, many different times. Every time we played the robot, we gave it a different brain, which here we're going to refer to as a controller. So each robot is actually controlled by a neural network controller. We're not going to spend uh, a lot of time talking about these controllers today. For our purposes, this neural network that's inside the robot collects information from the robot sensors, transforms those sensor values in some way, and sends values to the robot's motors, which cause its body to move. So the same robot, we can send different controllers, meaning the robot will move in different ways. 
If you want, you can think of the R's as bodies and the N's, the controllers, as brains. So we have uh, R0 here, the worm, that was issued a given command, C sub IJ, and that command, um, when that command was issued, it might have been issued many, many times, and every time it was uh, issued to the robot, the robot had a different brain and moved in a different way. So I sub, <coughs> sorry, N sub I, J, K corresponds to the kth controller, the kth brain that was evaluated under command J on the ith robot. So far, so good? Okay. For each one of these brains, like this particular brain here, N, I, J, K, um, as we just saw, for that, for for a brain, um, for example, in the the Teams chat here, there are one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine positive reinforcements, nine BYs. So that controller that you just saw um, will get nine positive reinforcements, which we're going to store in yet another variable called S which is our reinforcement signals, and S sub IJK1 is going to be an integer, which is the number of positive reinforcements. In our case, S IJK1 will be 9. I see in the Teams chat here that there were two negative reinforcements. So S sub IJK0 holds all of the negative reinforcements. So in this case, S IJK0 is 2. Uh, someone just had their hand up for a moment. Philip, did you have a question? No? Okay. Okay, so uh, so you, I think hopefully you get the idea. We have a whole bunch of these robots, a whole bunch of different commands that were issued to them. When they heard that command, they were running a, a, ran, a, a brain on that robot, and for that brain, that brain collected a certain number of positive and negative reinforcement signals. Here's, uh, here's a, another point in time in the experiment. I've just sort of sped this up so you can sort of get a sense of, of how this works. So you can see we're altering back and forth between the different robots. This, the same robot, like the quadruped here, the different colors are, are just for, uh, just telling us that we've got different brains that are running on those uh, robots. One of the interesting things we noticed during this experiment, one of the interesting things is that you'll often see people in chat teaching each other. So on the surface, this is a crowdsourcing project in which we, we tried to collect large numbers of human teachers to teach robots. But the teachers are also teaching the teachers. They're teaching each other about how this thing works and, and agree, arguing amongst themselves about what move actually means. And thirdly, the robots are also, the robots are teaching the teachers. The robots are suggesting what they may be, what, uh, what commands or what natural language these robots may be able to ground in their own experiences. You'll notice that neither the worm nor the quadruped robot has arms or hands or fingers. So telling, and there are no objects in this world. So trying to teach the robot to grasp, pick up objects, carry objects. Those are not worthwhile commands. So the crowd tends to converge on commands that seem groundable by the robots. This is yet another example of affordances. The robots are advertising, they're projecting affordances about what may be groundable, what they may be capable of grounding, what, what aspects of language they may be capable of grounding. Okay, kind of tangential to what we're going to talk about for the rest of today. Okay, so let's have a look at this data set. Uh, we ran Twitch 1.0 for, I think, about six weeks, if I remember correctly. During that period, over 400 people came to the Twitch Plays Robotics uh, channel. Uh, we sent, or we simulated over 57,000 robot evaluations. By robot evaluations here, this is just, um, 
the different brains that were run on the robots. So every 30 seconds, we, we switch up the simulation and we drop a different brain onto the robot. There were over 57,000 of them, but most of those were never observed by uh, a user. There was no one on the stream. Uh, there's no one on the channel uh, at that time. We collected a total uh, over 16,000 pieces of chat from these 424 uh, subjects. Over this, I think it was a six week period, um, people typed in, uh, among, uh, among those 16,000 pieces of chat, there were almost 9,000 commands that people, people were trying to send to the robots, which averaged out to about each of the 424 people on average sending 20 commands. Most of those commands uh, were repeated many times. You, you could see in the stream that people typed in walk forward many, many times. So among those almost 9,000 commands, there were 266 distinct commands that people typed in. We ranked those 266 commands by the number of times they were typed into chat. And the most common one was JUMP, which was typed in 385 times, followed by walk forward, move forward, run, and crawl forward. So as I just mentioned, the robots are in a way teaching humans. As you, could, as you can tell, these five commands are things that the robots will spontaneously do, which suggests they may be capable of grounding them uh, in their own experiences. Um, this is a very long list. The ones towards the bottom of the list are kind of interesting. Um, one person typed in uh, the command prove for Matt's last theorem, which uh, as far as we know, the robots have not yet been able to solve. Someone else typed in um, be yourself. Do you think these robots are being themselves? It's kind of an interesting right one, right? They either are always doing that or maybe never doing that. Someone else typed in the command, look at the camera. So as you can see, we put these googly eyes on the robot, so it would be easy for the, subject, the human subjects to be able to tell what's the front of the robot, the back of the robot, what's the robot's left, right, and so on. There is a virtual camera that is inside this virtual world, and yes, the robot can, in theory, point its googly eyes at the camera. The eyes are non-functional, at least in TPR 1.0. The robot can't actually see the camera, so that was kind of an interesting command. Okay, in addition to typing in all these commands, people typed in a total of 7,500 uh, positive and negative pieces of uh, reinforcement, and I won't talk about these uh, statistics. I'll come back to them uh, in a moment. Any questions about the data set before I move on? You can probably guess where we're going to go next. Now that we have a data set, we're going to apply some machine learning to see if we can find correlations between the words and the robot's actions. OK. OK, so now we're going to move on to the machine uh, we're going to move on to the machine learning uh, side of things. In this, in this first example, the robots moved and generated responses from the crowd, and we collected all that data. And we're now going to take that, the data from the robots and, uh, 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 and the words and try and find a correlation. We're doing it after the robots have acted. This is known as offline learning particular type of uh, machine learning. The opposite, online learning, would mean that the robot tries to learn while, or the robots try and learn while they're acting. That's a more difficult type of machine learning and we did not tackle that in this early experiment. Okay, <coughs> so what did, how did we do this offline learning? Well, after we'd finished with the stream, we took um, every single, we took every single uh, sorry, sorry let me, uh, I forgot to mention something. So for the machine learning part, we filtered the data, meaning we just focused on jump. Since this was the most common command issued to the robots, we wanted to see whether the robots, when they heard JUMP, just that part of the data set, could the robots learn from that? Uh, could, the, could the robots learn what jump means? 
So we took all of the we took all of the controllers, all of the ends that were issued under the command jump. So all the different brains, there are a whole bunch of those brains. We took each one of those brains and we re dropped it back into the virtual robot and let the robot do its thing again. So this is, we're running it in the physics engine, but now the Twitch crowd is not seeing this simulation. We put sensors in the robot. In this case, we put touch sensors in each of the Actually, it's easier to see here. We put t touch sensors into the robot's body. Let me back up to the slow one. There we go. In the case of the worm, we put three touch sensors in each of the three panels that make up the robot. And when each of these panels comes into contact with the ground, the touch sensor reports a value of one. When that panel is off the ground, that touch sensor reports a value of zero. So uh, it's not, not like our touch uh, system, which is very responsive, very fine-grained. We have continuous values of pressure, just one or zero. Is the panel on the ground or not? In the case of the quadruped, we put four touch sensors, one in each of the four legs. Touch sensor registers one when the leg is in contact with the ground, and the touch sensor registers a value of zero when the leg is off the ground. Okay, so the robots are going to have to try and ground their experience. They're going to have to try and ground the word jump in very thin soil, just binary touch information. So here's JUMP. We take one of the brains that was run on the worm when the crowd issued JUMP to the worm. And uh, when the worm moves with that brain, it generates a matrix that has three columns corresponding to the three panels that make up the worm and a series of rows where each row corresponds to a time step in the simulation. So I apologize about the small font here. Hopefully you can see this. But at, in the first time step of the simulator, when the robot was running this particular brain, the front panel was off the ground, the second panel was on the ground, and the third panel was off the ground. At the next time step, when the robot moved, now the front panel remained off the ground, the second panel remained on the ground, and the third panel, um, which was off the ground, had now hit the ground. So we have a binary matrix with three columns and a series of rows and the number of rows corresponds to the number of time steps in the simulator that was used to simulate the robot's motion with that brain. Okay, that's again a lot of detail. I'll just to pause for a moment if anybody has questions let me know. Okay, so if we have a whole bunch of these brains for a robot, we're going to get, for each of those brains, we're going to get one of these uh, binary matrices. We're going to call that binary matrix T, uppercase T for touch, and it's going to be each matrix, we're going to reference that matrix with three subscripts, I, J, K, which correspond to the three subscripts for the brain. So for brain I, J, K, it has a corresponding matrix IJK, the, se the touch sensor matrix. Okay. Remember that when that brain was running on that robot and that robot was issued the command JUMP, the crowd was watching that robot and typing in uh, yes or no, which gave us, uh, uh, which we counted in S sub zero and S sub one. We're going to take those two integer values, the number of yes votes, one and the number of no votes zero and we're going to normalize them we're going to sum their absolute values on the denominator and subtract the number of neg no votes from the positive votes on the numerator which is going to give us this new uh, this new floating point value o i j k o is the crowd response to uh, this particular controller controller i j k we're going to normalize this so that O ranges between 0 and 1. Zero, the O will be 0 if there was unanimous negative reinforcement. If there were three people watching and all three people voted no, 
O is zero. If there were 12 people watching and all 12 voted no, O is zero. O is unanimous negative reinforcement. And O equals one corresponds to unanimous positive reinforcement. There were five people or nine people or 12 people and there were five yes votes or nine yes votes or 12 yes votes. What does an O equal 0.5 indicate? For a given controller IJK, if O sub IJK equals 0.5, what does that tell us about the crowd's response to controller IJK? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. An O of zero means everybody voted no. An O of one means everybody voted yes. An O of 0.5 means what? Exactly, half no, half yes. Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? A split, split vote. It doesn't tell us how many people voted. It could be four yeses and four noes, or 43 yeses and 43 noes. That, that we don't know. Okay. So hopefully uh, you can see where we're going. We now have the robot's physical experience in the matrix T, and we have the social response to that experience in O under that command. Let's have a look at what some of this data looks like. Um, on the horizontal axis here, we're gonna have for the, uh, for the worm robot, we're gonna, uh, sorry, let me back up for a moment. This is a scatter plot. Each point here corresponds to the one of the brains that we ran on the worm robot when the, when the command was jump. And you can see there are several hundred of those brains that were executed on the worm robot under the command jump. On the horizontal axis here, we're plotting the proportion of time that the worm was grounded. What do I mean by that? I mean the proportion of time that at least one of the three panels was in contact with the ground. So uh, Joey Annetzberger, who worked on this uh, project, she took um, the T matrix, she took the T matrix associated with each of these points and looked at each row, and if there was at least one one in that row that means there was at least one panel on the ground and that was that counted as uh, ground being grounded if she came to a row and there were all three zeros that the, the robot was ungrounded so she's basically counting in that three by n matrix the number the fraction or the proportion of n rows that had at least one one in them yeah Okay, so if we pick this point down here in the very bottom right, this point has a proportion of time grounded of almost 1.0, meaning for almost every single time step in the simulator, at least one of the three panels was in contact uh, with the ground. <coughs> if we go over here to the bottom left, here is a particular brain that caused uh, the worm robot to be grounded less than half of the time in the simulator. Okay. The vertical axis here represents normalized reinforcement signal, and I realize now that I misspoke. A value um, O actually uh, actually ranges between minus one and plus one. O equals minus one is unanimous negative reinforcement, all no votes. An O of plus one corresponds to unanimous positive reinforcement, all yes votes, and an O of zero is a split vote. My, my apologies. Okay, so the higher the point is in this picture, the more the crowd thought that the robot was actually jumping when it was issued the command jump. Okay, you'll notice this is kind of a messy plot. There's sort of points all over the place here. But if you take all of this data and perform a very, very simple form of uh, a very simple form of machine learning called linear regression, most statisticians don't even consider this machine learning. Uh, it's a very, very simple technique. If 
I give you a straight line and I ask you to place that straight line anywhere uh, anywhere in this plot so that that straight line is as close to the po all the points as possible, you'll get the dashed line that you see here. You'll see that the uh, cloud of points is pretty diffuse, so there is no good fit. There is no good linear fit. There's no good way to place a straight line into this uh, scatter plot. However, um, this particular point is as close is the best you can or sorry this particular line is the best that you can do and you'll see that this line this line has negative slope this line with negative slope is that we produced with linear regression is our way to try and find a relationship between um, the robots experience and the word what does the word no mean? The wor robot doesn't know what the word mean. It only knows that when it acts in a certain way, it gets a particular social response. So this line is actually, again, binding together three things. The symbol itself, the physical experience of the robot, and the social response to the robot's action. What is the negative slope? Tell us. Tells us a few things actually. <laughs> Let me rephrase the question. Why, when we try to place a straight line into this figure, does it, why, why does the line have a negative slope? Any ideas? What does the negative slope tell us about the crowd? Forget the robot for a moment. Ethan says, less reinforcement when the robot stays close to the ground. So when the robot stays close to the ground, uh, that's over to the right-hand side of the plot. And there is more, not less reinforcement, but more negative reinforcement. Less or more reinforcement, it would be the total number of votes. That we don't know here. So you're close. There's more negative reinforcement when the robot stays close to the ground. That's correct. What is that? And then the inverse is that there is more positive reinforcement out here in the top there's more positive reinforcement out here when the robot spends less time on the ground what does that tell us about the users or the participants in this study put yourself in the shoes of the participants so they were watching this crazy robot jumping around flailing around in this virtual world they were told that they should give the robot a yes if they see it jumping, and they should give the robot a no if it's not jumping. This was the data we got back. When we fit this data with linear regression, we got a negative slope. What does that tell us about the participants? tells us that the participants were being generally truthful. Imagine that the participants didn't understand our instructions or they didn't care about our instructions and they just typed yes or no at random. You would expect to see a random distribution of points in this figure, but it's clearly not a random distribution of points. If the crowd was hostile, meaning that they wanted to lie, if we told them to type yes when they saw the robot jumping and type no when the robot wasn't jumping, if they lied and they typed yes when the robot wasn't jumping and typed no when the robot was jumping, you would expect to see this figure flipped. You would tend to see more points in the upper right and more points in the lower left. And if we tried to fit a point to that data, you would see a line with positive slope. 
So one of the things that this negative slope tells us is that on average, the crowd was generally truthful. Let's have a look at, uh, actually before we move on, um, just an interesting story about the crowd. In general, they were truthful, but that wasn't always the case. Um, in the first few days that we launched this experiment, not surprisingly, that's when we got most of our traffic. There was a lot of interest. Somebody uh, posted something to Reddit about this. We had hundreds of people come and try this out. Um, we were watching the stream, obviously, at that time because we had a lot of heavy user traffic. We, we saw one person who said, hey, it seems like there's some scientists trying to do some, do some experiment here. If you want to break their experiment, come back at 11 p.m. Eastern time tonight and we'll make a plan. So not surprisingly, when we saw that, we also, as the investigators, came back at 11 o'clock. At that time, this bad actor placed a link to a Reddit post. We followed the link to the Reddit post. And there the bad actor said, okay, let's try and break this experiment. Um, whenever the robot uh, moves forward, um, uh, or sorry, sorry, they said, let's try and teach the robot forward, back, left, and right. So they decided on four commands they were going to try and teach the robot, which luckily weren't in the, the, the top of the list here. But instead of using the words forward, back, left, and right, this bad actor proposed four very bad swear words instead. So if you see the, we're going to issue the word bad word, and that bad word is our code word for forward. So if the robot is moving forward when we issue that bad word, give it a Y. If it's not moving forward when we issue that bad word, give it a no. Same thing for the other three commands. So. Ironically, they, the, these bad actors were actually trying to do what we wanted, which was to give a consistent reinforcement signal. Yes, when you actually see what, what it should be doing and no, when it isn't doing what it should be doing. But they were trying to teach it the wrong words for forward, back, left, and right. So those bad actors came back from Reddit and at, from about 11.30 at night onward for a few nights, they tried to teach these robots four bad words. Somebody else showed up in the chat who said, hey, there are these bad people, these bad guys are trying to teach these robots these terrible words. So good guys come here at 11 o'clock or 11.30. And whenever you, see, uh, whenever, you see that, whenever you see that bad word and you see this list of bad guys uh, saying that bad word, if they vote yes, you vote no. If they vote no, you vote yes. So there was an, another group of the good guys who were coming back and trying to counteract the uh, reward signal, the reinforcement signal issued by the bad actors. Kind of an interesting, spontaneous uh, social dynamic which was tangential to the robotics experiment, but you tend to get those kind of interesting uh, dynamics when you're building crowdsourcing systems. Okay, here's the data for the worm robot. Here is the quadruped robot, which remember has four touch sensors, one in each of its four feet. Um, there were several hundred brains that we dropped onto this robot when it was issued the command jump, and each of those several hundred brains is represented by uh, these dots in this picture. Again, we plotted uh, on the horizontal axis the proportion of time that the quadruped robot spent on the ground. Uh, using that, that brain and the vertical axis is normalized reinforcement signal. And again, we got a negative, when we fit a straight line to this distribution of points using linear regression, we got a, we got a negative slope. Which means that for this robot also, for this robot also, the more time that it spends on the ground, the more negative reinforcement the crowd provides. Okay, so I would argue that this line is the robot's, uh, th this is the robot's understanding of what JUMP means. What JUMP really means to this robot is that if I spend more time on the ground, the crowd will give me more net, no votes. If I spend less time on the ground, the crowd will give me more yes votes. It's kind of an interesting twist on the meaning of the word meaning. 
jump means something to the robot. What it means is a relationship between what the robot experienced and how its crowd of human teachers responded. You'll notice that uh, the word jump actually means something slightly different to these two different robots. What is it? In some way, jump means the same thing to both robots. More time on the ground, more negative reinforcement. But it also means something slightly different to both robots. What is it? What's different here? And what does that difference mean? Any ideas? So the general rule, uh, Ethan says, um, one of the minimum ground times of one robot is higher, right? So you can see the minimum amount of time that the quadruped spent on the ground is higher, which is not surprising. Not surprising. It was harder for the quadruped robot to get all four feet off the ground than it was for the worm. So the worm has a, I don't know how to put it, a more energetic understanding of jump, right? Okay. Uh, as Nolan mentions, which is also correct, is that the threshold for what the robot sees as being on the ground is, is different, right? So they both understand the word jump as a relationship between felt experience and social response, but that relationship is slightly different for the robots as a function of their bodies. This is uh, the main focus of my uh, research lab, which is this concept of embodiment. And we'll talk more about embodiment when we get to the robotics section of this course. An interesting twist on this experience means the embodiment or the particular shape of the robot's body actually influences how it understands language, which is kind of an interesting, interesting twist here. Okay, again, tangential to HCI, but kind of perhaps uh, an interesting application of crowdsourcing. The last part of Twitch Plays Robotics I want to talk about is now that the robot is armed with this understanding of jump, it has this straight line in hand, the robot can actually make predictions about its teachers. It, can do, it understands not just jump, but it understands something about its teachers. If the robot were to, uh, if the robot were to think about performing an action, remember a robot that can make mental models. So if our robot metaphorically closed its eyes and considered uh, a particular action that would cause it, it to spend half the time off the ground, the robot can actually make a prediction about how the crowd will respond. How does the robot make that prediction? And in this particular example, when it's thinking about spending half the time off the ground, what prediction about the crowd does it make? If you were to ask the robot, the robot's thinking about spending half the time off the ground, and you were and you asked the robot, you said, if the crowd actually saw you perform that action where you spend half the time off the ground, what do you robot or how do you robot think the crowd is going to respond? How many? Uh, what's the fraction of yes and no votes you're going to get? Any ideas? Closer to, to one. If we take this linear this this linear this relationship, which from the robot's point of view is its understanding of the relationship between experience and social response, 
and we just keep drawing this line outward, it's going to intersect with this red line. The red line is all the different ways that the crowd could respond to the action in which the robot spends half the time off the ground. The place where these two lines interact is going to give the prediction. So in this case, the blue robot here, the quadrupedal robot would say, I think I'm going to get an O of 0.43. So 43% more yes votes than no votes. Alternatively, if the robot considers standing still, which it never did, you'll notice that there is no green dot touching this red line here. So if the robot closes its eyes and says, I wonder how the crowd would respond if I stayed still, the robot can make a prediction again. What is the robot's prediction in this case? How does the robot predict its crowd of human observers, its human teachers would respond if it saw the robot standing still, if they saw the robot standing still? Notice the intersection down here. In this, in this case, the robot would predict an O of minus one, which is unanimous negative reinforcement. The robot knows, even though it's never done it before, the robot knows if it stays still, the crowd will say that is not jumping. Okay. All right, I think that's enough about robots for today. We have uh, five minutes left, so let's uh, just uh, let's just dip into our uh, next lecture on um, on input output devices and tangible computing. So we're thinking about technology that spreads outwards uh, into the world. Um, we just saw robots, which are have sensors and can directly sense the world world. A lot of interesting uh, tangible, a lot of interesting interactive systems can also directly feel or cause tactile feeling in their human uh, in their human users. We spent a lot of time in this course already talking about uh, the visual side of interaction. That's most of how we receive information from technology. We spent a little bit of time talking about sound. We're going to spend a few slides in lecture 15 talking about the third most important uh, sense organ to humans, which is our skin, which gives us, uh, among other things, touch information. As always, we're going to distinguish between raw sensation, which is pressure, heat, or vibration that arrives at our skin, arrives at or on our skin. It's passive. We don't have much control over it. We're going to talk about raw sensation, but we're going to spend most of our time talking about haptic perception. How do we draw meaning out of those various signals? Okay. Most of, uh, most of our input devices actually rely on touch. We need to touch our keyboard, touch our mouse, touch our uh, mouse pad, and so on. But there are very few output devices that output onto our, back onto our uh, skin. We're going to look at a few examples today which are kind of, uh, they may just be kind of interesting applications but may not uh, see wide adoption. But you can imagine certain applications in which these kinds of technologies uh, could be useful. So we'll watch this short video uh, from, uh, from MIT about one of these tactile interfaces. Clearly a very useful application, having your cell phone come to you. Interesting uh, integration of haptic and visual feedback.
Okay, I think we will pause there uh, as just informal homework. I'd like you to think about what potential applications, aside from the toy applications you saw in this example, uh, might be useful for this kind of interactive technology. You're working uh, now on deliverable uh, eight. You have a quiz due tonight. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you back here uh, on Thursday. Bye-bye.